Welcome to the Honest Designers Show, your transparent look into life as a modern designer. My name's Tom Ross, and I'm the founder at designcuts.com. And this week, I'm joined by my fellow Brit and hand lettering expert, Ian Barnard, as well as American retro design expert, Dustin Lee. In this week's episode, we talk all about competition in the design industry. There will always be other designers bidding for the attention of your current and potential clients, and it can be really easy to let this stress you out. However, it can also be empowering to realize that you're ultimately in control of how much competition you encounter and how you react to this. Let's get into the show. So the Honest Designers are back for 2018. It's our first episode of the new year, although we are down Lisa this week, right? So it's just us fellas. She wanted a longer holiday than we did. Yeah, why are we down Lisa anyways? I never I never was quite sure. I'm pretty sure none of us read her email, so I have no idea, but she's, she's going to be back soon. I feel like she's on a beach somewhere. <laughs> she did, didn't she say she was moving or something and she would be out without? Um... Oh, yeah. No, I think she had prior commitments oh. for that. So, she's I mean, ca- castle. it seems pretty suspicious to me that it's the peak of the summer where she lives. So mm-hmm. I'm going to go with the beach theory. Mm-hmm. But anyway, it's great to be back. I'm feeling pretty pumped about this year. We've got a lot of cool stuff lined up to talk about. And we're going to take the show to new heights, hopefully. I know we're, we're talking about doing a bunch of listener questions. We're going to have some more guests on the show and really just take on board everyone's feedback and try and make it as good as it can possibly be. I can't believe we've done a year already. Have we oh, really? no, 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 it hasn't been a year, but it's we're, we're in our second calendar year. So that, that counts for something, hopefully. I thought we'd been a year. Oh, <laughs> No, but we are fast approaching episode 50, which... oh. We we'll have to do something. We we'll have to like ban Lisa or do something to celebrate. We have to meet is what we need to do. Yeah, we do. Now, especially now that we know that I'm actually my DNA test came back showing that we're <laughs> of the same we're the, of the same DNA, my friends. Kind of. <laughs> Look at that. What are you? Twelve percent. Twelve percent British. Twenty seven percent Scottish, Irish, Welsh. That's a good yeah. mix. That's like <laughs> close, but no cigar, my friend. So for this first episode of 2018, we're going to be talking about competition. And I know we've touched a little bit on other people copying your work and some of the mindset in a busy design space, particularly when it comes to selling products. But we haven't really talked about the mindset of having competitors when you're pitching for client work and when you're just trying to make a name for yourself, when you're trying to win business. But this is a real thing. This is a thing in every industry, of course. And there's all different areas on the spectrum, right? So some people live in constant paranoia. Others collaborate with others. Others hate their competition. I guess a a lot of it's going to depend on your personal situation. I would imagine a lot of the folk at home listening are in very different positions when it comes to this. But one thing is for sure, they all have competition. You can't be a designer and not have competition unless you're super super niche unless you're like ian who's the only guy doing vegetable calligraphy or something (laughs) and even then you better believe that there's some guy like sharpening a turnip right now gunning for you the thing is if i made any money from it then i would have you know (laughs) yeah it's a fact it's it might be a niche but i'm not getting any money in that niche so (laughs) i don't know whether you can call it like i haven't got any competition because like someone else is vying for that free product (laughs) <laughs> true but you're getting so many of the things that money buy though fame i mean von glitch could describe fame as a designer as being like a famous plumber but amongst designers you know you a lot of people know you i know mm-hmm. you've done you've gotten to fly places anytime someone gets to fly places i feel like that's a sign they're doing well like they flew you out to do that lettering thing with um in iceland in iceland yeah mm-hmm. you'd you collaborated with someone in Canada. I mean... Yeah, he just got back from Canada. I'm envious yeah. of Ian's life right now. <laughs> Ian makes it sound like he's living in squalor, but I mean, this is a jet-setting hand lettering artist, which almost sounds like a paradox, but he's made it work somehow. 
but but a lot of it is just quite distractive as in like uh like i you know the the canada one was a course i'm hoping like a few months down the line will be released so um and the iceland trip was uh just the opportunity to go to iceland and that was all uh so the thing is it's a lot of really fun things but i don't know if it feeds my children or not <laughs> it will hopefully in it one day one day it will do so yeah, I, i'm exactly. just hoping the thing is it, with a lot of these things it's the long game and that at some point mm. there's certain things that you like, like with youtube i'm hoping that at some point that will be a source of income more than mm. the hundred dollars it is at the moment but um, you know, you just have to think. Okay, give it a few. You just years. have to long game it. Yeah. Have you thought your kids might have more to eat if you started cooking your vegetables instead of drawing with them? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Not after <laughs> they've been inked, though. <laughs> <laughs> but Ian, I feel like you're particularly qualified to speak about competition because you're it seems to me pretty high up on the hand lettering ladder of people doing it. But that's a really competitive field. Mm. Maybe the most competitive field right now. I mean, right, what do you think, Tom? I feel like that's a huge field. I saw a, um, you know, Google Trends. Yes. I saw hand lettering on Google Trends and it basically showed how it was an actual trend that has just exploded over the past few years. And I don't think it had peaked yet. So basically it was this massive upswell in people talking about it and subsequently doing it. So mm -hmm. I think... More, moreover than uh, you and I, even Dustin, I'd say hand lettering every week. You're just getting a flood of new people on mm -hmm. that scene. So, um, yeah. I mean, first of all, how does that feel, Ian? Like um, so many people do what you do. Uh, so, you, I suppose I think because um, I've been through it with like products on my shop and how you know. Like for me and Dustin, we started when there wasn't much competition and now there's lots of competition. I suppose mm -hmm. it's a similar thing where you, I think it's really important for me to stand out and others to stand out by using their personality to drive their work rather than just being a hand letterer who can draw letters by hand, you know, because there's there is a ton of people doing it. It has to be unique. It has to have your own spin on it to really stand out from the crowd. So for mm -hmm. me, I'm just trying to, um, I suppose YouTube is something I'm trying to cement myself within the genre. So, because if, you know, if, like I, I, I say a lot of the times is, is, you know, with the long game of social media, is that me putting on all these years of work, it means that, you know, hopefully my name will still be known for it, you know, even within the, you know, loads of people coming up. Because mm -hmm. um, you can't just suddenly do a bit of hand lettering and hope that you'll get a load of work in. Yeah, or if they're, if, if they're trying to do the same thing, if they start trying to build a social media presence, it's like, okay, I'll see you in five years, buddy, because... Yeah. That's how long I've been building mine. Like you have, you have more to fall back on. And yeah. I like to think of social media as a bit of a web. So it's like every video, every piece of content you have out there, um, particularly on YouTube. Have you seen this where every video will get at least some views every month? So even the real old ones. So all of those are like opportunities for people to discover you and your brand and what you're all about. Yeah. And all these little webs you've got spread all over the web now just keep. Totally, yeah. totally and the thing is if you're starting now i think you can still um there's still opportunities to um it's about carving out your own little piece of the internet you know it's big enough mm -hmm. the world is big enough that if yeah. you put in the, you know the time and the practice to um make this craft your own and you post like like dustin's doing posting daily and be patient so it's like you've got the speed of the daily posting so just having like you know 30 minutes just to quickly post something but you have the patience to wait a like minimum of two years before you think like, like i waited thing is it wasn't so crowded when i first started and so it was like a year a year and a half when i first got like a my first hand lettering job like my first proper hand lettering mm -hmm. job oh 
Okay, so here's the question: In how yeah. has it shifted? So you you've just said it was a lot less busy when you started. How have you felt that shift occur with it getting busier? How's that affected you directly? Um, I th- I think I've seen like a lot more feeds showing, or like me realizing it. It's been a lot more f- typographical feeds showing all this stuff and showing a lot more people doing it. Um, uh, I. I suppose I know I, I, it's, it's hard sometimes because you sometimes think uh, there's so much content on there. Is that why my sometimes my posts don't get the same amount of traction that they used to get? Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And it's like, is that affected by the fact that there's so much content out there? People can't view everything at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I often feel like competition basically forces people to up their game though. Yeah. Like you just said, some content that still does great and some doesn't necessarily do as well and i think naturally as things get busier the cream always rises but as things get increasingly busy really only the very best stuff is gonna stand out so it was probably easier when there was less people um but as well that's how industries move on because if there was never competition people would rest on their laurels so competition does actually um then beget quality yeah. which I think is ultimately a good thing. It might feel stressful when you were loving life and you were the only guy in town doing it and suddenly there's a flood of new people. But when it kind of forces your hand to then innovate and people keep changing the game and, and, and just upping what they're doing, that, that has to be a good thing, I think, for design as a whole. I would I would add to that that because I think being the best or the the, the cream rise in the top is, is certainly 100% true. But by definition of that, not everyone can be that. So that leaves a lot of people on the bottom. And I think one thing that can be empowering, I guess, to people that are either the cream or, you know, somewhere in the middle or whatever, is that there's things you can do that can help to improve your odds of beating your competition, for lack of a better word. Whether that be, you know, like you've discussed before, Tom, like better follow-up sequences with people, having better conversations with potential customers. Or like Ian said, injecting personality into injecting your brand. Injecting personality. All those things, you don't have to be the best. Yeah, and also I guess with art and design, it can be quite subjective. So it's not like you are saying we're the best race car and that's very black and white. You know what I mean? It, it like you, you can't necessarily say, well, I'm the 53,000th best, best designer on earth and I'm going to work hard and, and get 50,000th because you can't necessarily rank it that way. So whilst I do think the cream rises, quality stands out, what is quality to us might not be quality to someone else who's interested in paying for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I also think there's a greater long tail with design. So for everyone listening who doesn't know what that means, the long tail is, th- think of like the the short tail is like the people who are killing it. They're at the top of the game. They're, they're making a, a ton of money. The long tail is kind of the rest of us. And I think there's certain industries where the long tail is very, very difficult. For example, being a rock star or something like that. Like, <laughs> You know, if you're, that's a if perfect you're, one. Yeah, like if you're if you're Mick Jagger, you're fine. Like you know, you're you're making a fortune. Everyone knows you're happy days. But if you're not in that pretty small short tail of big names, then it's very hard to make a living as a musician, unless you're a session musician or something like that. But as like a standalone band or musician, very very hard to make a living. I think it's a lot easier with design because we are naturally selling something we're selling a service right so even if no one in the scheme of things has heard of you and no one really knows you you can still carve out this little business for yourself and you can still make some money and and support your family and so on Mm -hmm. and that has to be exciting because i've got friends who are musicians and actors and things like that and i just look at it and think oh man unless you really get a break you're kind of screwed in life and we'll probably have to give up on your dream Ooh, that was brutal. Yeah, it's true though. <laughs> yeah, true. it is. Like, and it's it's terrible to see, but um, it kind of is. So I don't know. What do you, what do you think about that? Um, why, when you were talking about musicians, I was very conscious about 
Ed Sheeran and how he analyzes like why aren't I number one in China? Do I need to go and tour more? So he will go out and do a tour to Does he really? So he, yeah, he kind of treats so, it like a business instead of just an art form. Yeah. Um well, you know, he I does he's very that. talented and he does um he has created some amazing records. But I think there must be there must be a side of people in like the music industry that, that part of it is the business sort of side. Mm-hmm. Um and 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 I suppose it's the same with whatever craft you niche out for yourself for like for me uh, in the first place it was all about the craft all about the enjoyment and now it's become my job it's hard sometimes to separate the craft from the the hobby from the business and so sometimes I'm like okay I need to make some money from the stuff I'm doing and so it's a weird it's sometimes a weird mentality as you're having to get creative to earn money through the thing that was your hobby do you know what i mean you, you, can't, you have a sort of take a different approach to it in a way yeah and within the balance of competition i guarantee you were never thinking about competition when it's just a hobby no you couldn't care less what anyone else is doing but suddenly it's like hold on that person over there is like taking the money that was going to go to me and my family yeah. and that's going in their pocket the thing, and it's hard. I suppose it's. Uh, I I can't say that anything's hard really because I feel I'm very blessed in my position. But I sometimes analyze why, like, um, you know, I compare myself to others all the time, and like someone who's very similar to me in a similar position is my f- good friend uh, Stefan, who does hand lettering. But sometimes his his posts might get like, like twice three times the amount of like engagement or or likes or you know stuff like that and I go well, what what is it that I'm doing wrong that doesn't get that and so it's uh and I might think you know he's getting a uh he's getting this opportunity to do this uh but then I think oh, I've had that opportunity or I've had you know I might have had similar opportunities it's it's amazing how you you have your successes or your like mini successes and then you they sort of go away and you forget about them and then you're thinking oh, okay there's this person who's getting this opportunity i think you know you look, it's that comparison to others in the sort of the competition thing mm. when it you know sometimes can't be it's not healthy because oh. it can distract you from what you should be focusing on totally well and it's it's toxic and it can make you start thinking that the way to get those jobs you want or the likes you want or the, whatever your goal is, you start thinking, oh, I must do more of what that person is doing, which is probably the opposite of what you need to do. I have a, a book that I love called Free Prize Inside by Seth Godin. And he has this thing called Edgecraft, he calls it, inside of it. And he says, the way to stand out and make sure that people don't duplicate you and you're not competing against them is to, in your particular niche or industry, go to the farthest, most extreme edge that anyone has ever gone to that you feel comfortable with. And the farther out you go that way, the harder it is for someone to compete against you because they have to make the commitment to go that far out too. And it's scary. Have have you got an example of that? Well, yeah, um, I can use myself as an example to a degree. So I decided to focus on, you know, retro stuff was really popular. And then I remember watercolor and lettering was was coming up and becoming these more popular trends in design. And I thought, well, what should I do? And I decided to double down on the retro stuff. In fact, I doubled down so much that I said, I'm going to really focus on mid-century American stuff. Mm -hmm. Because I thought in order to directly compete with me, the more stuff I release that's similar to that, someone has to put their flag in the ground and say, mid-century American stuff is my thing. And that's really hard to do. That's a big commitment. I haven't done that perfectly, but I feel like the more I do that, the harder it is to plant your flag there. Mm-hmm. No, that's really smart, actually. And I, I suppose for me, in a similar vein to what you is that, you know, I'm releasing a lot of Procreate stuff because I want to try and cement myself as um, the person who can letter on the iPad and can release brushes for it. And that you think, you know, when you think retro stuff, you think Dustin, you know, and hopefully when you think about iPad lettering, you know, there's a handful of people, hopefully, where I 
can be one of that that group. So it's yeah. the vegetable things was a little bit weird, whereas <laughs> <laughs> the procreate stuff is like you know a bit more practical with being you know oh you're the guy that does a lot of stuff on you know the iPad, which mm-hmm. is a great thing to be because then you know that gets into people's minds that you know if they say oh we need someone to you know do a workshop on it let's um you know they search for you and they they might find you find you so mm-hmm. it's, i think it's, to just interject really quick i think what's so powerful about that vegetable thing though and we constantly go back to it which is almost proof in itself of it is that no one else can do that without everyone saying oh he's doing the ian bernard thing like you planted a flag so far out in crazy land <laughs> yeah. that you own that. Anyone else who does it is just a copycat. Yeah. And I think that the more you can plant your flags in places like that that are connected, interconnected like a web, like Tom was saying, that's pretty powerful. I've got an idea, Ian. Why don't you do how to hand letter using an iPad and physically use the iPad as the lettering tool? <laughs> to go and like scra- <laughs> scrape an iPad over something. That would go so viral. Because <laughs> people would click on it and then they would love it more when they saw it. <laughs> yeah. What I need to do is get like one that's broken. Yeah. So I don't damage my 800 <laughs> Shiny pounds. new one. You totally should. How to um, draw with an iPad. I know, that is a good idea. I'll have to note that down. Um, okay. Be- bearing in mind this show's going out on Wednesday. <laughs> so yeah someone's gonna beat you to it and speaking speaking of speaking of competition shame you didn't come up with the idea like a couple of weeks ago when it was like snowing in the uk that would have been perfect (laughs) exactly um like dustin that was a good point are you just saying um that you sometimes you have to go completely far out there and stick your flag to you know cement yourself over there but you can't earn any money over there because it's way too crazy and it's way too it's not something that companies can see themselves using but then you can use it's that happy middle from just normal whatever you know like everyone the standard hand lettering that people might be doing and then there's a the craziness and then there's somewhere in between that mm-hmm. yep is where you can earn the money so so for me i gone crazy <laughs> <laughs> this sounds a bit weird. Gone crazy, but I've I've been able to sort of drill it back to now. Now you're getting practical. Yeah, yeah. And so, and like every every so often, I don't earn money from the random bits I do. It's just attention. You know, it's the money I get from people knowing that I may sell Procreate buses or that I may sell fonts or I may sell this. Um, yeah. But you know, that gets traction. That gets a lot of traction, and that means more eyeballs coming to my site or coming to my feed yeah i think sometimes you can be can be like you know well, what's the point of that's a bit silly but i suppose the internet can be a bit silly and some of the stuff that and, and i suppose that's my personality of like you know serious serious sometimes a bit random serious 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 <laughs> and i and and i suppose that's what you know i sometimes use my kids toys to do stuff and it's just that sort of spark of my personality just being combining with my I'm doing a sensible job that mm-hmm. then that's where the sort of I suppose the magic happens or where you know things combine and then you can actually make some money from it and I think yeah. it's working out it's experimenting and I I did a post the other day that blew up where it was just talking about my story and how it took me 34 years of trying lots of different things before I fell into click fee. And, but it's just trying, you know, it's, tr- you know, if I, I did the vegetable thing as a random post, I didn't think it would go anywhere. And I thought people would think it's stupid, um, but it did go somewhere, even though people thought it was stupid. Um, <laughs> and it got me featured on the BBC and you know, I couldn't have thought of uh, that would happen, but it was from me trying it that these opportunities popped out. So I think in, even in with co- sophisticated evil planning, you couldn't have made that, you couldn't have came up with that. No, and I think that's it's like there's hardly anything even in this world of like an overnight success. It's drawing people in, but seeing that you've also got that work. If you did like a random thing and then people came to your website, your feed, and there's nothing to back up, actually he does really good work or he's he's got a portfolio of work there, they go they're gonna stay. But if you do some random stuff and there's nothing No substance. No it. substance, then that's that's the problem. So it's making sure that you know, you know, there's a lot of people who are you know going along doing the, the the maybe the same thing, similar theme in their work, but then they just that personality injecting the 
injecting the fun, injecting the um, the 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 edge of of mm-hmm. their niche to draw the attention, whether that's from businesses or whether that's from people as well. You know, just audience. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so there's a couple of things here. One is starting to think about the spectrum of being right out there on the edge, where there's probably no money, but more opportunity to garner attention and certainly less competition. And then there's the other side of it, where there's a ton of competition, a ton of money to be made as well, but things are really tough there. And then there's the thought that if you look at that spectrum as being your body of work, you can actually kind of dance around on it quite a lot. So. As you say, you, you can do something right out there on the edge, get a bit of attention, bring people back into the fold and, and they can check out your more practical stuff. So you don't have to necessarily think of yourself as fixed on the spectrum uh, with regards to competition. But I think it's good, similarly to uh, you mentioned Ed Sheeran and how he's quite deliberate with how he targets certain markets and stuff with his music. I think just us discussing this right now has has got my mind racing and i think a lot of people perhaps don't think about this stuff and they're not very methodical and they're not very deliberate about it so they might have no idea that they've accidentally landed in an incredibly busy niche of design and they're inundated with competitors and really they're just feeling the negative results of that and they're not sure why But I think if people are a bit more deliberate and they kind of look at what's happening out there and go, okay, you know what, I'm going to plant my flag there because I think that's going to be a medium where there's some money to be made. There's enough piece of the pie to keep me happy, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to go mad with stress. And a lot of that plays into your character. So if you're super competitive and you want to beat everyone and you think you've truly got the talent, feel free, like jump into that real, real competitive area and try and be the best in the world. But I think for a lot of people, it actually suits them to go for a slightly quieter niche where they can make a name for themselves. They're not constantly battling people who are trying to tear them down and like get a land grab for money. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a case of actually stopping and thinking what suits me as a person and as a mm-hmm. designer, rather than it just happening to you like some kind of accident. I think it's about amplifying who you are. You the the parts about you that are unique amplifying them as much as possible and i can't lettering hand lettering is such a great subject we're talking about for this because the competition is so heavy that i feel like it leaves so much open to talk about with it and i can't help but think about a dina rodriguez has a shop called letter shop and she does lettering and she has gotten two book deals she's done all sorts of stuff she's been invited to do a so many things doing uh talks or workshops at creative south this year and a variety of other ones she's done adobe things and her personality stands out so much because for instance a lot of times you go on and look at lettering stuff and it's all the same you're like this this could have been anybody this could have been this other person i know or this person i know so for instance one example is she saw a lot of apparently there's like a lot of ones where there'll be a nature drawing and they'll say something like the outdoors is calling and I must go or something like that. Yeah. I'm probably saying it wrong. But so she made one that said, because she's not an outdoorsy person so much. So she said, my bed is calling. So I must go sleep or nap or something like that. And then she had like a, you know, did it all like that. So it looks like it's going to be that one, but then it <laughs> surprises you and it's her. She's like, I'm watching Netflix and my bed is calling and that kind of stuff. She does that constantly. I mean, she lives and breathes it. It's not a gimmick. It's just her and so many people are like, yes, nature doesn't call me. I don't want to go climb that gigantic mountain. And I feel <laughs> like when people do that, it's so authentic because I see some of these posts and I'm like, I bet it's been like a year since you've walked a na- nature path. There's so many people like unsplash photos and then draw like stuff over the top of them of nature. And I'm like, I bet you don't have a tent. <laughs> or the classic one where it's a girlfriend who's like extending her hand backwards and the boyfriend's taking the picture and holding her hand. You know the one I mean? <laughs> what? No, I don't know. <laughs> so the, the photo is like a girl walking away from the camera, like trailing her hand behind her and oh, yeah. the guy's like reaching out to <laughs> link okay, fingers yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yes. And I just feel like they mix and you can't tell and it becomes like homogenized. And mm-hmm. Can I just say that I'm guilty of that in my, at the beginning, I did a lot of... Uh, <laughs> I did a lot of the, uh, you know, the adventure stuff. And like, yeah, I'd love to, but I'm like too busy uh, um, 
you know, taking my kids to school or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyday life. No, I, I remember that though. I remember your adventurous stuff and I never looked at it and thought it was cringe, but I guess you've adapted as well as that stuff has become more mainstream. Yeah, I think cause the thing is like we, like me and Dusty started with those vintage logo templates that people could edit. Now I look at them and I'm like, oh, I just, yeah. I, there's so many. I think when something becomes popular, it loses some of its value. A hundred percent. Like with our bundles at Design Cuts, we see packs now and go, two years ago, I would have like bitten my left arm off to get that in a bundle. And now it's a great product, but we're not even going to run it because it's been so done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that's been like those images. So for me, I still use Unsplash images, but I use try to use them in a like uh, I used one of like a, a a shoe isolated on a white background with laces coming out of it, and I turned laces into typography, you know. And so right. it's more of like mixing in with it. I had one of like a jar of lights, and I took out sort of a glowing pen in Procreate. Yeah, that and- that was cool. I like that one. I remember that one. That was cool. It it adds out adds more to it if you can think more, you know. It's, and sometimes I still do just put some text over a photo, but um, <laughs> it it just adds more if, if the text, like the lettering you're using, interacts with the photo, mm-hmm. or there's something that is a different angle rather than just the mountains and just the word adventure that there's yeah. something that's maybe personal to you or mm-hmm. something that is pers- you know connects the photo so well together you know that it p- makes people stop because you need to think how many how many posts there are per day how much content is streaming out there then people are just going to scroll by if it's something they've seen before but if it's something that's like well hang on a minute that was that was a bit different why why mm-hmm. was that different and 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 actually going from like my post last week which was um that did really well it was like 50 i don't know where how the percentage but like 50% the photo 50% the caption or 50% the video just how how well i managed i don't do it all the time it's like one in a blue moon but how well i i do the video plus write about what i'm talking about and I think when sometimes it hits a note with people and it resonates with it, mm-hmm. it it's like the perfect storm of a post. Um, yeah. And you can't get that every time. And if you did, it just dilute it. And I think sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, it just really, you know, if you can hit those two things really perfectly, then... And I was getting some lovely comments about the post being inspir- inspirational for people in terms of what they where they were at the, per- the time. And Dustin's had that with some of his posts. Just... Mm-hmm. It's it's the post, the picture captures the eye, so they stop, and then it's a case of they read the description and actually this, you know, if it's a story, like in terms of a lot of Dustin's case, it, it might resonate with people. Some resonate more than others. You know, if it, one about your dad really resonated with a lot of people who, who were in a similar position. Yeah, true. And so, and that that won't resonate as much as, you know, with me because I'm not in the same position as you, but there are a lot of people who are. And what so, you're saying, though, is there's ways to cut through the noise. Yeah, there are even when, ways. Even when it gets very loud indeed. It's very loud, but people, it all comes back to the story. I'm not, every so often I might write a half decent story, but I'm not very good at writing stories. And mm-hmm. I think people, it's still about the emotional connection with your audience or just that one person. Mm-hmm. And, and people yeah. on a world where it's all quite superficial – people need to read something real and that's why you know i re- i think what dustin's doing is really helpful for a lot of people and how honest and transparent he's being is being really combined with his art form and that's just and that's what we're looking for it's not you have to be heavy on emotion it's just about telling a story and, why and being authentic did. we yeah we did a we did a we did a whole episode on that didn't we like expressing your authentic self and your work and i think it is so pertinent to the idea of competition because it's the key thing that lets you cut through that because so few people are authentic but i think what is what's so important actually is to not get precious because if you sit there and go mm, i don't like the fact that things have got noisier i don't like the fact that things have changed that's not really going to do anything and you can sit and complain and stress and worry or you can react and you can evolve 
because Ian, you can't do anything about the hand lettering world getting busier. Mm-hmm. You can't control the world around you. Dustin, even like your daily challenge, I think it's amazing that so many listeners have started doing the daily challenge and posting their work every single day. But even that is going to become played out, right? If suddenly yeah, everyone on, on the face of the creative planet was doing a daily challenge, you'd see it and be like, oh, another one. Right. Well, and this was happening way before this too, for sure. There was like the 100 day challenge. I mean, these have been around forever. Yeah, exactly. So anything can get played out. It's up to us to then evolve what we're doing and find new angles because you can't just sit on your hands and kind of wish things went back to how they were. It doesn't work like that. I, I got to give this. This has made me think of like this weird uh, metaphor or analogy came in my brain as we were talking about this. So online people don't see you so much as they see your work and if you think of your work like your clothes imagine you're on public right there's all these designers and everyone is wearing the nature is calling and i must go outfit right (laughs) or just different ones like that you know different variations of that and everyone's wearing that and you look down the crowd and you can't really distinguish any one person because everyone kind of looks very similar that's fine but everyone's going to blend in but when all of a sudden you see like the dude in the crowd at the airport that has like the really ridiculous neon orange hat with like something like <laughs> playa on it or I don't know, you know, some Oh, you saw me. Great. Yeah, like like Tom has, like that weird orange player hat he wears. <laughs> <laughs> when you have like a couple of things about you, you know, it doesn't have to be a ton. Maybe you're just wearing some bright shoelaces, or maybe you have, I don't know, a face tattoo, whatever your thing is. <laughs> everything about you can be fine, but there's just a couple of things that people say in a crowd that oh, that's him. He's the mm-hmm. one that always does that. Nobody else does that. And if they did, it, everyone would call them out on it. I think you just need to find what's the thing about me that is special and weird mm-hmm. and hard for anyone to duplicate without being called out. And it doesn't have to be insane. It just has to be you to mark you, you know? Okay. So here's, <laughs> here's a metaphor for you, Dustin. Imagine we're in the airport and everyone in the airport represents our competitors and everyone listening, their competitors. So airport full of designers <laughs> and cool. originally everyone's like all looking the same they're all wearing the same but then suddenly you notice someone and they're like i don't know a punk and they've got their hair spiked up all over the place and the full punk outfit and they just stand out like a sore thumb so everyone's staring at them and they get all the attention and in this yeah. case attention equals business mm-hmm. so then what happens when someone else starts becoming like a punk and then someone else does something different and they're wearing like complete neon clothes. And before you know it, the whole airport is there and everyone is like screaming for attention at the top of their lungs and doing ridiculous stuff. There's like a guy running naked <laughs> through the airport to get attention. There's people wearing the craziest stuff you've ever seen. And I think genuinely this is like a metaphor for the state of some parts of the internet and some parts of the creative industry the where there's especially. so much screaming for attention and everyone being wacky and out there and how on earth do you stand out in a situation like that? But if you but if you think about it like this, like let's say that you're doing hand lettering. We'll kind of continue with this airport thing because <laughs> because it's crazy. So why not? <laughs> let's say that you were. It's all <laughs> graphic designers in the airport, and all of them are doing hand lettering stuff. And people are look and some people are looking down trying to pick who they're going to use, right? And one person is like, I don't know, like has a chef's hat on or whatever. And like, you're a person up there looking for person, people to do hand lettering for your restaurant. And there's, and there's a, and there's a percentage of people up there that need restaurant stuff done. If you have stuff that stands out and makes your weird flag show of, Hey, big fan of deep fried Twinkies, big fan of like, you know, double stacking my Big Macs, whatever, you know, to, to a certain kind of food person that needs lettering done, who are they going to pick? I mean, you're going to pick that person. Just like I'm doing a rebrand. There's tons of people that do different kinds of illustration. Who am I going to pick? I'm going to pick the, you know, I'm going to pick the guy that does the really best, wackiest retro style illustration. I'm going to push back slightly because I think um, an answer we often give is niche down. So for you, like you said, if you need a designer who you're a chef, you need a designer, you're going to pick the guy who does food websites or food logos. And that makes a lot of sense. But what about all the designers who don't want to niche down that much? What if I want to do a variety of work? I, I want to do work for all different kinds of businesses and all different kinds of clients. And I want to do logos and websites. And I don't think that makes me a jack of all trades. That just makes me a designer who wants to have variety in, in what he does day to day. 
I don't think you'd have to do them like all um, food ones. Maybe your thing is that, I mean, there's all sorts of ways to niche down, but I feel like anyone who's successful, in fact, it'd be interesting to hear what people have to say as suggestions of people that haven't niched down and been extremely successful. I can't even think of, a, of an example of a designer that is, I'd, I'd say, wow, they're super broad and that sure has made them successful. It's really hard to do that. Whereas it's much easier to say this person stands out because of this and that sure has made them successful. So yeah, you can do that. But <laughs> yeah. here's the thing is you can only, you, you can do any, everything you want, but you can only do the one thing at once, right? So pick your thing and do it. doesn't mean you have to do food lettering forever, but I just, I've never heard someone say, man, my plan is to do everything for everyone and then they have massive success. But maybe I'm wrong. I'll give you an example. So I'm thinking more agencies rather than individuals, but I've seen a lot of brand agencies, for example, and sure, their thing is branding, but they have a variety of really disparate clients. And Can you give an example? <laughs> I've seen a few recently, but honestly, the name um, kind of escapes me off the top of my head. But e- e- even like, um, yeah, like I... The, the, all right, there's, there's been a few I've seen recently, um, and I'm not trying to fumble here, but like genuinely, you know, successful brand agencies exist, right? I do, but you could argue that they, their niche is that they do successful things like Coca-Cola and Nike, and that is their niche. I mean, that that's a niche in itself. <laughs> what, doing like bigger clients? Doing gigantic multinational corporations that are in the, you know, whatever 100. I mean, you could say that is a niche in itself, that they know how to handle the massive challenges of working with global companies. The thing is, I think it's quite hard to sort of compare massive brand agency with like an individual. (laughs) They can have, like, you know, you have an umbrella of all the niches, you know, the people in your team who could help like the hand lettering specialist, you can have the motion graphics specialist and, you know, stuff like that. So, whereas if you're just one person, um, because what happens on the branding websites is you see like, you know, the night campaign and it'd be a specific campaign and it'll show you the the online advertising, it show you TV uh, spots and all that. And it'll show you this and take these massive brands and do the whole job together. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know there might be individuals who want to take a hey, take a maybe a smaller company because it's I suppose it'd be quite hard to do <laughs> that as an individual. But you need to um, package that into something that when they come to your site, rather than you just having this over here, this over there, this here, you say I make it clear that you want to do the whole package, mm-hmm. and and. Because you want people to come to the site and instantly know what you're about. And if you're doing too many things, it can get confusing for the person looking at your website, saying, well, what do they do? So it's maybe thing, it's either saying, you know, okay, I do, might be you want to just do startup brandings. And so you say, you take it from here, initial stage, all the way to the end. You know, I hold your hand through the whole process. Yep. Um, I think it's working out what you want and then, really nailing it down into something really much smaller so you might be like a breadth you know because doing a brand thing you know takes you know lots of different design abilities but making sure you can sort of clearly communicate what that is so if you wanted to do because i was doing lots of different things when i was doing general design and it wasn't that clear on my website what i actually did (laughs) so and it was just a you know a mix of there was a logo here and then something else there Mm-hmm. For some people, you might just think, okay, think of three things you want to do really well, and then that could be the thing when they come to your site. I do, I do your logo, and I can do your website, and I can do, yeah, you you offer a package, yeah, and so you can either buy these three things together, or you can buy them separately. If you start like I do, I do logos, I do brochures, I do websites, I do you know this, and it's all a bit scattered. <laughs> It's really hard for the person to go, okay, do I need all that things or which one of these things are they really good at? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I I think it can be useful to think about the total amount of competition. So let's imagine there's a million designers out there and every time you make a decision, that number goes down and it's thinking again, where are Mm -hmm. you going to plant your flag? So you say, okay, I'm going to offer a complete brand solution suddenly that million becomes 100,000 because no, that's cool. nine, 90% of people 
haven't bothered to do that. And then you go, okay, and I'm going to target businesses of a certain size, which is over here. So that 100,000 becomes 20,000. And then you just do that over and over and over again. And then you're in control of that. And and it's also not permanent. So uh, what, one of my favorite examples of this was uh, Stephen Snell, who did website design for churches. Like that's pretty niche. I, in fact, I don't think I've ever, I might have seen one other person ever who's done that. So if you've gone from a million people to two people <laughs> and you're still able to make a living, happy days. But maybe he was going, <laughs> okay, there's not enough money in this. So I'm, I need to go slightly broader. So I'm going to go from two people to 50 people in terms of my competition, but I'm going to make five times as much money. And as I say, that doesn't have to be a permanent thing. If you're not happy, you can always change the same way you could say, well, I actually hate how many competitors I have. I hate the stress of it. They're making my life a living hell. So I'm going to settle for less money, but greater happiness because I'm, I'm just going to choose to move my flag. Mm-hmm. And any anyone listening could do that. If, if you're feeling discontented about either how much money you're making, or how stressed you are, or any other factors, you can just look at it objectively and go, you know what, I'm going to move my flag over here and see how how that feels. I love that because I feel like we we all tend to feel like we're stuck where we are and we're not allowed to move. Like there was this rule that was secretly programmed in our brain that once you put down your flag, as we've been calling it, you can't move it. I think it's empowering just to, like that you even mentioned that because it so sometimes feels like you're not allowed to. It does, right? You feel stuck, but it's you chose to be there. <laughs> no one forced you to be there. And I felt I felt guilty that I didn't like much of design, you know, the different avenues of design. I thought you had to, when you were a graphic designer, you had to like everything about design. And actually, I don't like making websites. So people love it. I don't like it, actually. I've, and it was something I was doing, was my main source of income for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And actually, I don't want to build another website in my life. <laughs> yeah but how empowering is that i don't want to new i don't want to do another brochure i don't want to do uh, <laughs> are you sure <laughs> uh, yeah like i i really liked doing the websites back in yeah. the day but brochures bore the hell out of me mm-hmm. it's a similar thing uh, <laughs> it's not being oh, the right word to like say defeatist or defeatist yeah. but it's knowing yourself it's being self-aware of what is your passion and trying mm-hmm. to find out what I because I found it easier rather than listing the things that you like doing is you've got your graphic design listing the things you don't like doing mm-hmm. helps clear the path for finding the things that you do like doing. Do you know what I mean? No. Yeah. Uh, hold on, I've got a I've got a sound bite just to piggyback on that. I think a successful design career comes from combining your self awareness with market awareness. You with me? So literally figure out who you are and what you care about and what you love doing, but don't make the mistake of what so many people do and just leave it there. Do the same thing with the wider market. Mm-hmm. Can, can you give us an example? Yeah, like, it, okay, you're the example. So you looked at it and went, I don't like doing web design and brochures. I prefer to do hand lettering. So that's part one complete. Okay. Part two is let's have a look at the market and what's out there and how am I going to be able to tap into this in a commercially viable way where I'm not just indulging, you know, what I fancy doing on a personal level. I'm actually thinking about it from the wider world. So it's that kind of introspection in terms of what you like to do. And and then it's actually looking outwardly, but with a very self, a very um, acute awareness of what's happening, what people are paying for, what's trending, where the attention is, where the money is. Mm-hmm. so it's just like I, bam bam part one part two i love that i love that idea because it's kind of reverse thinking in the sense that you find what you love but then instead of trying to find some way to package it or say it or cram it down people's throats so they'll buy it you're looking at the market and then going back from there saying okay now how can i get what i like get what the market wants and then instead mm-hmm. of trying to force it people to buy it go backwards from what they want and what i have you know what i mean i think that's kind of what you were saying yeah it's like marrying the two together that's the dream right that's a happy successful design career 
Right. Instead of hoping like you hit the design lottery and what you happen to love is just what happens to be what people throw money at your. Yeah. Or that you chase the money that you're miserable doing work that you hate. Yes. Yeah. And I know it sounds so simple. Do what you love. Go where the money is. <laughs> um, but it can really be a seesaw and a juggling act to to get that balance right. And also, I do think a lot of people either do none of the equation or only half the equation. And then uh, just frustrated, like, why is it not working for me? It's like, well, because you actually had no awareness. You completely lacked self-awareness. You didn't spend the time to figure out what you loved. Or you were so hung up on, like, doodling all day with what you loved. You are completely unaware of anything to do with the business or the market that you're in. I think the other fatal flaw of that is sometimes the things people love, they are not good at, but they so want to be good at. And then they wonder Mm -hmm. why people don't buy it. Yeah. And like, they just can't give it up. It's like, you really want to be that, but you're not like, I really wanted to be a singer when I was in a band when I was younger, tried so mm-hmm. hard, took singing lessons, man, I'm a bad singer. I'll sing for you right now. I want to show you. Actually, <laughs> I, won't. <laughs> no, I won't. No, I no, won't. no, you can't see that up. You have to sing now. And I'm the worst singer in the face of the planet. So, um, yeah. hmm. <laughs> I can't think of to sing. <laughs> But to, to wrap that up real quick, I, I wasn't good at it. And like, I had to just be the guitar player in the band. Like, no matter how much I tried, it was pushing a boulder up a hill. Mm-hmm. It wasn't going to happen. Yeah. And it's not easy to accept that sometimes. Yeah, I think there's, a, there's, a, um, there's stuff that can be learned and taught and some things you're naturally gifted at. And it's, yeah, I suppose that self-awareness of... um self-awareness of whether whether that is something that actually can happen or not i feel that anyone can learn you know within within reason anyone can learn cliffy because it's muscle memory like anyone can learn the guitar um yet there's this point where it goes to another level which not everyone has um Mm -hmm. you know that can just take and so, and, but then there's not a problem with that because, like, you could, you know, you learn a craft. You, there's lots of crafts you can learn, and then you can teach other people, and that's the way you monetize it. Mm-hmm. But taking it to the level of being like the expert is when the talent kicks in after you've learned it, if you get what I mean. Because mm-hmm. you see those people who are just phenomenal, like, like um, doing like videos. You know, like mm-hmm. someone's on YouTube and they just, the combination of you like a drone and a, some slow mo shots and they're just beautiful and they're just another level stuff. You can teach yep. that, but you, the another level stuff is where the talent just sort of, you know, everyone's at this level and then suddenly the talent kicks in once that craft's been learned and it just goes, Phew. but there's, yeah, but you know, that's for those people who have that natural gifting and, and you know, there's nothing we can do to touch them. But you can monetize at the craft level. So singing is a weird thing because it's like sung most of my life, you know, being in church and stuff. But I'm not a singer, <laughs> right? Like, like I can carry a tune, but it doesn't have that beautiful timber and smoothness yeah. that someone, some people naturally have. It, you know, there are some things that are just, yeah. You maybe have to think actually is, no, yeah. None of us are going to be Olympic athletes. No. None of us are going to be the next Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, it's just not going to happen. We could put all the work in in the world. It's not going to happen. And it leads to, an, and we all have this, and is our un- inability or stubbornness to let someone expose our blind spots or to acknowledge our blind spots. And I, I feel like for me, for Retro Supply, that did well because I was in a desperate position and I chose to acknowledge the blind spots. And instead of spending 20 years trying to compensate for those things that I knew I wasn't good at, Mm -hmm. I decided to find the quickest, most efficient way to compensate for my inadequacies. So I guess I'm saying like where your blind spots are, like, do you really want to spend 20 years like doing it? So what are you saying? You doubled down on your strengths, basically. I doubled down on my strengths and I swallowed my pride and admitted, hey, you suck at this get someone else to do this or use an asset of someone that is good at this. You know, like if I was going to make a cover and it had hand lettering on it, it would be so ridiculously dumb of me to try to do my hand lettering for the cover of it. When there's someone like Ian who could literally sit down and write it on a piece of paper over coffee in 30 seconds and I could spend two weeks and it would look like trash. (laughs) 
It would just be <laughs> dumb. And so like I'd have to swallow my pride and say someone else will do this better and then I can enjoy actually making a living. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So final closing thoughts when it comes to competition. We've I feel we've gone kind of broad and philosophical here. Um have we got any actionable bullet points to wrap up with? So little quick fire round. I mean, and feel free to repeat some of what we said just as a, a bit of a summary, but I, I'll kick it off. I would say realize you can plant your flag wherever you want it. And if you're not happy, you can move it. So mm. you choose how much competition you want to endure and just be aware enough that you know, more money is going to be more competition almost always. Less money is going to be less competition. Where do you want to be on that spectrum? I liked your point just a little bit earlier about the, the um, um, you know, the more you niche down, the less competition there is. Yeah. Um, I think that's just really, and I thought, I, I, and seeing that in my own career, how, how the opportunities and the, the work from being a local jack of all trades to being like doing international work as a mm-hmm. niched creator. I, I, I have a feeling the more you need niche down the, you know, there's probably you can niche too far, but the more you niche down, the clearer your message is, mm-hmm. you know, the clearer of what you do is. Yeah. And then you can always layer on top of that, right? Yeah. So if you're making a comfortable living, but then I don't know, maybe you have a family and you decide I need to earn some more money, you can keep doing what you've been doing, but just look at different angles. So it's like, well, I'm going to add a new revenue stream. I'm going to start selling products over here. You can still capitalize on that niche on on the back of a solid foundation. So you don't have to be tied down in that respect either. You, you, ne- you don't even necessarily have to move your flag to a completely different space. You could just try a few different things. Mm-hmm. I, I would add as another bullet point, the road to anxiety, pain, and sorrow is trying to photocopy your competitors. If you want a sure prescription for being miserable, just photocopy your competitors and try to do what they're doing every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100%. I, I would say be aware of your market and no more. Like be be aware of what's what's out there but really more from a a client and customer potential i think it's a great thing to pretty much ignore your competitors for the most part just charge full steam ahead doing the best job you can do honing your craft thinking of ways to constantly innovate and if you do that you will naturally distance yourself from your competitors because the more you look at them the more they're not only going to weigh you down mentally but you will actually inadvertently start being less original and start copying them more. T- totally agree. When my son goes, come on, dad, I want to race you. I, you know, obviously I let him sort of go off ahead. But the problem is he keeps looking behind at me. And <laughs> what happens is, is he falls over because he can't, you know, when he, what happens is if you look behind, especially on a bike, you look behind you and you lose your balance. And I, it's exactly what it's like with business. If you look, keep looking to the side or looking behind you, you lose focus of where you want to go and you just end up just tripping over and grazing your knee. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a beautifully succinct <laughs> metaphor Metaphor for that. Yeah. We do love a metaphor on this show. And yeah, I think that's a really good one. So um, yeah, on that note, whether you are a kid on a bike looking back or you're a punk in an airport, I hope this episode helped you to think a little more about competition. And bye from the three of us. See ya. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode. We hope that it helped you to reframe how you think about competition in your creative industry. As always, you can find full show notes over at honestdesigners.com or find us over on iTunes by searching for The Honest Designers Show. If today's episode helped you, then it would mean the world to us if you took just a moment to leave us a quick review over on iTunes, as this is one of the best ways for other designers to discover the show. 